Joining me now is my good friend, Hill Goodspeed. He's coming to us from Pensacola, Florida. Hill is the editor-in-chief of Hook Magazine. In fact, I have my latest issue right here. And Hill and I were just out in Reno for Hook 22. And Hill, this year's theme was 100 years of aircraft carriers. Let's talk about that time frame because we've come a long way during those 100 years. I tried to find a photograph that really encompassed those 100 years. And uh, one I located was the commissioning ceremony for USS Nimitz, uh, lead ship of the, of the Nimitz class carriers, which would been that ceremony occurred in May of 1975. And it's an image showing the, uh, the official party uh, led by President Gerald Ford, who spoke at the commissioning. And they um, are gathered there for really a milestone um, commissioning ceremony. It had been the first carrier uh, to appear in the fleet for a number of years and, of course, was the uh, second nuclear-powered aircraft carrier following uh, USS Enterprise, which had been commissioned in the early 1960s. But on the reviewing stand or on the, the stand for the official party that day were a number of individuals that if you collectively take them together, uh, all of them, they represented those full 100 years of carrier aviation. And starting with Admiral Ralph Cousins, uh, who at the time was Sinclair, and uh, he'd flown in the Battle of Coral Sea in May of 1942, which was the first engagement in history in which the opposing ships never came within sight of each other. Uh, all the blows inflicted on the respective fleets were by carrier-based aircraft. Also in the crowd that day, or on the official stand, was Admiral James L. Holloway, who'd been the skipper of USS Enterprise uh, when she made her maiden combat deployment. So he led that ship uh, in launching the first ever carrier strikes uh, in a combat situation uh, from a nuclear-powered vessel. Uh, the CEO of USS Nimitz uh, was Captain Brian Compton, and Compton had flown from USS Oriskany during the Vietnam War, uh, received the Navy Cross actually flying with BA-163, the Saints. And of course, then you had President Gerald R. Ford. He was the commander-in-chief uh, at that time. And, but he also had a Navy background. He was one of our presidents who actually served in the Navy and specifically in naval aviation. He was not an aviator like uh, his successor, George H.W. Bush, but he was ship's company uh, on board the same type of class, same class carrier that President Bush flew from. Uh, Ford uh, was a member of ship's company on board USS Monterey. And one of his skippers uh, during his time on board Monterey was Captain Stuart Ingersoll. And Stuart Ingersoll had a long career in naval aviation, as most uh, carrier captains do before they reach that point. And among his service was flying from USS Langley. So here you have the full 100 years from Langley in 1922, uh, all the way to USS Nimitz, which is still operational today. It's astounding how much progress has been made in 100 years. And you look at USS Langley and compare it to USS Gerald R. Ford, the contrast is striking. Some ship had to be first, and Langley was the one chosen. Langley had been a collier, name was Jupiter, and it actually delivered the first naval aviators to France during World War I. So it was a ship that almost seemed destined to actually play a role in aviation uh, just by that measure alone. And Langley came about because those aviators, some of those aviators that she delivered overseas, had uh, had the opportunity while they were there to observe what the European powers were doing during World War I. And one of the things that they did observe was the Royal Navy. And the Royal Navy had begun operating aircraft, wheeled aircraft from ships, really giving birth to the carrier concept. And so those officers who were serving overseas, people like Kenneth Whiting, for example, they saw that and realized that we need to do something like that in the U.S. Navy. And so what they did is when they came back from overseas in World War I, they appealed to congressmen, appealed to higher ranking officers, appealed to really anyone they could talk to in the Navy's bureaucracy and the U.S. government about the need for these types of ships. And eventually there were appropriations made to commission uh, an aircraft carrier. And USS Jupiter uh, was the ship chosen. Uh, she was a little bit faster than the one, the other one they were considering. Jupiter was about 15 knots. So that's a, definitely a far cry from today. And uh, that was the ship chosen to be put into the shipyard 
and convert it to an aircraft carrier. So they cut down the superstructure, placed this flight deck, uh, flight deck on top of the hull. And so Langley was a uh, flush deck carrier, which means that she did not have an island like you see on most aircraft carriers. The bridge was actually located underneath the flight deck and the skipper couldn't even really see out uh, any sort of window to con the ship. So it had to be really creatively done to uh, actually um, operate the carrier. And you know, there was really no hangar bay uh, like we know it today because Langley, as a collier, her entire hull was filled with coal bunkers where she used to have the coal that she would use to help fuel ships. So that was very makeshift to create the workshops necessary to keep the uh, aircraft operational. Uh, on the flight deck itself, uh, that was another unique evolution as far as what Langley had. She had smokestacks off to the port side. And uh, the smokestacks had to be rotated to a position where they were parallel to the water uh, during flight operations. And that was to keep the smoke out of the pilot's eyes. And Langley had a, a very different uh, resting gear system than we do today. She had uh, not only the cross deck pendants like are familiar on carriers today, but she had fore and aft wires. Those wires had to be propped up by these um, devices they called fiddle sticks or fiddle bridges. And so whenever they hit, sometimes those fiddle bridges would go flying and they'd have to reposition them. So uh, that was something that was not the most efficient way to operate. But uh, Langley's first uh, carrier operations occurred, or first flight operations occurred shortly after commissioning in March 1922. And uh, the first landing occurred in October 1922. A guy named Godfrey de Chevalier made the first uh, trap on board USS Langley. It was actually, a, could be characterized as a, as a minor mishap because he nosed over and broke the prop. And uh, Langley was really a laboratory for a lot of what you see on carriers today. Uh, Langley had that some of the early experiments with using the different colored jerseys to denote roles on the flight deck that appeared on board Langley. Um, you also see uh, the birth of the landing signal officer. Uh, that uh, that was the, the first use of the LSO, first employment of the LSO to help guide uh, aviators into a successful trap. And you see a lot of operational stuff going on with Langley as far as how to use a carrier in fleet operations, um, how, how to maximize the effect of a carrier. From 1911 into the early 20s, it was a young man's profession. And so by the time the carrier was developing in the early 20s, naval, avi naval aviators, the ones who actually wore wings of gold, they were relatively junior in rank. So, I mean, the most senior aviators uh, in the early 20s were commanders. So you did not have any flag officers who were qualified aviators. So you needed some champions You need to make um, ships like Langley work and to champion carrier aviation uh, in total. And so naval aviation was very fortunate to have two individuals uh, who played uh, major roles in that. And they were William Moffat, Rear Admiral William Moffat and Rear Admiral Joseph Mason Reed. And these individuals were, one is considered the father of naval aviation and one has been called before the father of fleet aviation. Moffat was a was a really politically savvy uh, officer. Uh, he'd been, he was a Medal of Honor recipient uh, from the Veracruz insurrection in 1914. Uh, he understood power. He understood um, the power of publicity, um, and he understood how to uh, work the halls of Congress. So, combining all that together, when he became the first chief of the Bureau of Aeronautics following World War One. He was the one who championed the resourcing of naval aviation. And Admiral Reeves uh, was the one who went to sea and made the aircraft carrier work, made it become an integral, integral part of fleet operations. And Reeves was a battleship captain, uh, had, was born and bred in battleships, just like Moffat was. And from a battleship perspective, he understood the importance of, uh, in a fleet engagement, how many rounds you could put against the enemy ship as quickly as possible uh, compared to how many rounds that he could bring to bear on your ship. And all he did really, he equated that to the aircraft carrier. So in other words, 
he realized that even d- despite Langley's very small size, very limited capacity, the more he could maximize her ability to launch as many aircraft as quickly as possible and recover them as quickly as possible. In effect, he's maximizing the rounds in the form of the aircraft and their ability to deliver bombs and torpedoes that he could fly again or launch against the enemy. And so Reeves was the one who went out to the fleet uh, and fought tactically. And he challenged the aviators in a tactical sense of let's maximize what we're able to do. But you can have all the tactics you want. Uh, You can um, have thought through every problem that might present itself. But if you don't have the technology, uh, it really won't matter. And Langley was very limited technologically. She could not operate many aircraft. She was slow, which meant that she couldn't even keep up with the battleship. So at best, Langley was going to be an auxiliary. The carrier benefited greatly from the fact that the Washington Naval Treaty in the early 1920s, there was a conference that convened that created this treaty. And that conference's role was to reduce the number of capital ships that the great naval powers of the world had. So they reduced the number of battleships, reduced the number of battle cruisers. And that was uh, and created tonnage limits on those. And all of it was designed to prevent another world war. But carrier aviation was lucky because those uh, signatories to that treaty, those negotiators, they viewed the aircraft carrier as an auxiliary and not really a capital ship. So they allowed an increased number, a certain amount of tonnage to be devoted to carriers. What that enabled the Navy to do was convert two battle cruisers to the carriers USS Lexington and USS Saratoga. And these ships were a far cry from Langley. They were extremely fast. They could operate about 100 aircraft compared to Langley's generally less than 40. Uh, The way they were built, they had larger hangar bays. Everything about them was, uh, was, was just a far cry from Langley. Those ships could operate with the battleships. They could uh, demonstrate what naval aviation could do. And they did that dramatically, Fleet Problem 9, In January 1929, the tactical scenario was attacking the Panama Canal. And Admiral Reeves, uh, during the course of that operation, detached USS Saratoga from the battle line and with an escorting destroyer, made a high-speed run at night into a launch point off the Panama Canal and launched an airstrike against uh, the Panama Canal. Uh, Caught the defenders totally unsuspecting, and they dropped a lot of flower bombs uh, on the uh, airfield in the Panama Canal and demonstrated the ability of the, the quick strike potential of the carrier. And, but also what it was, was it was the first time really that a carrier operated independently from the battle line. It was the birth of what we know as the modern uh, carrier task force, strike group, battle group, whatever you want to call it. That was really the birth of that. And more carriers followed. You had the USS uh, Ranger, commissioned in uh, June of 1934, smaller than Lexington and Saratoga, but she was historic and she was the first aircraft carrier built from the keel up as an aircraft carrier. And you also have the development of tactics right along with that and the, the development of aircraft. And then dive bombing became really the important tactic uh, in World War II with, because that enabled uh, carrier pilots to When they went into a dive by the time of World War II, it was 70 degrees and they would would go down to altitudes of 1,500 feet. And what that enabled the carrier pilot to do was to, with a highly maneuverable ship um, below him, he could, in essence, uh, aim his bomb, adjust his uh, flight path as he was diving down and really plant the bomb in a very accurate way. And so dive bombing became a really central tactic and the the aircraft that they developed uh, leading up to World War II uh, were culminated really in an aircraft called the SBD Dauntless. And uh, uh, one of the real famous photographs of a Dauntless uh, was taken by one of Edward Steichen's photographers during World War II. And it's really a it's a it's a silhouette of one of them over Wake Atoll in 1943. And it really captures what the Dauntless was all about. The, the, the Dauntless uh, sank all four Japanese carriers the Battle of Midway, played a role in Battle of Coral Sea and, and the great battles in Guadalcanal. 
and served in from carriers all the way into 1944 during the Marianas uh, Turkey shoot, uh, the Battle of the Philippine Sea, and then remained in service throughout the war. One thing that's surprising to some people is that the Navy operated uh, two paddle wheel steamers on Lake Michigan. Uh, they were called USS Wolverine, USS Sable. Uh, they were converted, they were paddle wheel steamers converted to aircraft carriers, and so Lake Michigan was the gateway to the fleet for carrier pilots. That's where they learned to successfully launch and recover in a ship on a ship environment, a ship environment. And so you couldn't operate uh, carriers in a training environment in, uh, off the Atlantic coast or off the Pacific coast because turning into the wind and not steaming in that direction for hours at a time for CQ uh, was gonna make you pretty vulnerable or very vulnerable uh, to enemy submarines. So that's why they operated these carriers on Lake Michigan, and that's where the majority of carrier pilots received their initial traps and launches. The Navy bred a system where they were constantly regenerating uh, the knowledge base of the new aviators they were sending overseas. There's a photograph that I like of um, the F-16, the fighter pilots in the F-16 just crowded around an F-6 Hellcat. And that picture speaks to the individuals who went through Uh, the Navy's training program. They went overseas, served, developed their combat experience, and many of them were rotated back to the United States. In the Japanese case, you never went back to Japan unless you were pretty much wounded and couldn't fly again. They didn't have a rotation of training. So if you were a Japanese pilot, you essentially flew until you were too severely wounded to stay in the front lines or you were killed. So there was no knowledge base that was uh, that was maintained through the constant rotation. Like the Japanese would have never taken somebody like Jimmy Thatch, the developer of the Thatch Weave tactic of fighters, and like the U.S. Navy did, rotate him back to the United States to become an instructor who developed, actually he developed a number of training films and the like while he was on the home front. That would have never happened in the Jap- Imperial Japanese Navy. And so that was something that was very important in uh, World War II. So World War II ends and the aircraft carrier has become, uh, along with the submarine, which with with its inflicting of so much damage on the Japanese merchant fleet, those have replaced the battleship um, as the primary weapons of the Navy. But as far as the the surface strike platform, uh, the carrier was was actually was the queen of the seas as compared to what the battleship had been for for decades and centuries uh, before. But the carrier faced a challenge and it wasn't necessarily a challenge from uh, from an outside force, I mean, although certainly the Cold War had many outside forces that were gonna impact the US military. It was an internal threat for the carrier. And that internal threat was represented by uh, post-war defense budgets, uh, what roles and missions the various services were gonna have And really, it was what form of warfare was going to be dominant. And uh, the U.S. Air Force was established uh, after World War II, and the Air Force had been the service that delivered atomic weapons. And uh, they argued for primacy in budgets and in resources because uh, with atomic weapons, would there even be conventional warfare anymore? And naval aviation was faced with that threat. Uh, the, the resources were not there to uh, maintain the large fleet that existed in World War II, nor did naval aviation have the aircraft that were capable of delivering heavy bomb loads embodied by the nuclear weapons of that time frame. So the Navy really uh, fought the Air Force on that. There was a famous event called the Revolt of the Admirals, which was uh, in protest of uh, cuts to the U.S. Um, Navy's uh, carrier fleet. Really, it was a pitched battle on what role naval aviation would play in the post-war world. And so the Navy really hedged its bets on two sides. Um, on the one hand, they knew, uh, the leaders of naval aviation at the time, they had to be viable in the nuclear dimension of warfare. So they had to have demonstrate some ability to stay in the game from that standpoint. And so they used uh, aircraft carriers like the of the Midway class, which was USS Franklin D. Roosevelt, USS Midway, USS Coral Sea, which were commissioned following immediately following World War II. And they developed aircraft and, and showed how they could operate large aircraft from those ships. 
They operated PGV Neptunes from board from aboard those ships as nuclear weapons delivery platforms. They only launched them. They didn't recover them on board. And then they created an aircraft called the AJ Savage. One of my favorite pictures shows an AJ right uh, next to the island of USS Coral Sea. And so that was their head. They developed a heavy attack capability. But on the, by the same token, you had to have the ability to operate aircraft carriers in a conventional war as those would occur. So really what proved their point was not any debate uh, in Congress as much as when the Korean War erupted in 1950. Flying interdiction missions from ship to shore and projecting that naval power uh, in that way instead of in massive fleet battles that you saw in World War II when the carrier came of age. You, know, you can look at all the photographs of, uh, of aircraft carriers off uh, Korea. They demonstrate also something else that you see that's taking place after World War II, uh, which is the advent of jet aircraft. So it was a very deadly era. Um, in 1954, uh, there were 776 aircraft accidents. I mean, that's unheard of compared to the accident rates that the Navy has achieved today. And so what that spawns is changes in carrier design. Uh, straight decks become angled deck. Uh, you have steam catapults that emerge, uh, replacing the hydraulic ones, which are able to launch heavier aircraft and more efficiently. Um, you have the advent of landing aids. You know, there was no longer a situation where an LSO could wave paddles. Um, because the, the reaction time was just, so it was things were moving so quickly, just the ability for the pilot to react to a signal by waving paddles, it just wasn't going to be possible. So you have the, um, the landing aids, like the mirror landing system, which eventually evolves into the modern landing systems that we have today on board carriers. But the Navy does see a need to develop a large deck carrier because it still has to carry out the nuclear mission. So you need uh, a ship that can operate large aircraft. And, but it also has to have, be a carrier that can, can operate increasingly heavier and more capable jet aircraft. You do some aircraft as jets got bigger and more capable, uh, the Essex class carrier just couldn't operate some of them. And so you start to see commissioning the first super carriers. And the first one of those is Forstall. Uh, there's a famous uh, photograph of, um, of that ship. Uh, operating a stern of USS Lake Champlain, Essex class carrier. And if you look at Forstall, you can see the difference between the Essex class and uh, the modern supercarrier. And that's what Forstall represented. Forstall represented modern naval aviation, the ability to operate the A3 Sky Warrior, which was an aircraft that operated at 80,000 pounds first weight and was had the ability to carry your nuclear weapons. And you see the ability to operate the new generation of jets, like the F-4 Phantom, the F-8 Crusader, the A-4 Skyhawk, and all those aircraft that really became symbols uh, of the Cold War. But you also see the adaptability of carriers to different roles um, as called upon to do. So um, one role was anti-submarine warfare. And many of the super carriers were, they wanted to devote them to attack missions and strike missions. The Navy actually took some Essex-class carriers and turned them into anti-submarine warfare carriers. We saw the need of the advent of the helicopter to have ships that operated helicopters to project power ashore in that way by heliborne assault that would have been experimented with by the Marine Corps. And so you see some Essex-class carriers that were converted to uh, the forerunners of the modern amphibious assault ships. So they pointed the way to that. You had carriers that played a role in the space program. Uh, you needed platforms that could go out and recover spacecraft as they plummeted the Earth after the various uh, missions in outer space. The carriers become a, a vital instrument of foreign policy for many, many presidents. And, uh, and there are great photographs of presidents on board ships. I and mean, if you look at the administrations, uh, very rarely do presidents miss an opportunity uh, to visit an aircraft carrier, be it for President Obama visiting one to watch about college basketball game to President Kennedy uh, watching uh, exercises from them. That really shows how important the carrier is as an instrument uh, of American power. And that's not only in uh, combat situations, but projections of soft power in the humanitarian role uh, that, uh, that carriers have come to embrace uh, in, in the years since World War II, and there are numerous instances of carriers being used because of their versatility uh, as platforms to, to support peoples around the world when they face natural disasters um, and what have you. And as of this juncture, we've, we've settled upon the large deck flat top, 
and uh, the Nimitz class and now the Gerald Ford class as the most versatile uh, platforms, the uh, ability to operate and execute a number of missions. Over the years, they've been able to adapt these ships to different technologies, namely uh, the aircraft that operate from them. As Admiral Reeves envisioned back in the 20s, it is the main battery of the carrier. And it's interesting to see how that has evolved. You know, so if you look at photographs, say, from the, the you know, 80s and 90s, if you, you, know, you have a tag bird fly over a carrier, it, you see aircraft of all different types that have spanned multiple eras. But now, if you look at an aircraft carrier air wing, it's, it's dominated by multi-mission platforms uh, that, um, that sort of, of so aircraft of many aircraft of one single type, an example being the F-18 uh, Super Hornet. Uh, where, you know, at sea now, you have four different squadrons employing the Super Hornet and then the EA-18G Growler is, a, is, is very much a derivative of the Super Hornet. And so you have it, it's a very, it's an airline without the diversity uh, in types that you see in the past. And what we have going forward uh, is uh, USS Gerald R. Ford uh, scheduled to deploy uh, later this year, 20 in 2022, and that will be the uh, the most uh, the, the first time that a lead ship in a in a, a new class of carriers has deployed uh, since uh, USS Nimitz and embodies the new technology the the, the constant evolving of the carrier uh, in her in her case uh, emails and the advanced arresting gear system and all the myriad of modifications uh, that have gone into uh, making carrier aviation better. And, and making carrier aviation able to adapt to, to the challenges that, that it faces as, as it enters its second uh, century. So thanks again to Hill Goodspeed for that great presentation. All right, that'll do it for this episode. If you're not already a subscriber, click the button and ring the bell so you don't miss anything. And in the meantime, I look forward to talking to you again very soon.